Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam, Rasulullah, wa bad. So we have a very, very special guest today, Dr. Suleiman Tijani. Kaif Halak. Bekhair, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. It's a really big honor to have you on my channel. Excuse me. I'm very honored, very, very happy. We're going to discuss some very important topics concerning the coronavirus. And before we start, I just want you to tell a little, about, a little bit about yourself first. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, firstly, you know, let me, let me thank you for um, inviting me on. I'm giving what's going on um, everywhere. I think it's important for us to have this discussion. Um, so, as you said, my name is Sulaiman Tijani. I'm, um, I'm practicing uh, medicine. I'm a medical doctor, essentially, um, in New York City. You know, we know how it was hit um, significantly. It was an epicenter um, for the recent um, outbreak pandemic. Um, I, I'm from Nigeria, uh, and I did my medical training in, in Jamaica. And then thereafter, I came here for residency training. So Alhamdulillah, I just completed my um, residency in internal medicine, and I'm going to be furthering my training in pulmonary and critical care medicine. So that's Mabruk, where I'm going to be Mabruk. going on to next, uh, inshallah. So, Ayat you Allah. know, may Allah make it easy for you, Ameen, for me, Ameen, for Ameen. all of us in all our endeavors. Amen, um, amen. <laughs> right. So you, the reason why I, brought, I invited you on the show is because you're a frontliner. You, ha you are actually on the front lines of this whole coronavirus. And there is a ridiculous amount of misinformation concerning the pandemic out there, particularly in the black community. So like, I'm just a simple guy. If, if, if I want to find out the truth, I'm going to go directly to someone like you, right, who's on the front lines to see if this is real or not. So can you please like tell us some of your experiences uh, like about the coronavirus? First of all, is the coronavirus real or not? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think one of the one of the most important things um, for us to understand is, you know, many of us would have grown um, reading Sherlock Holmes, right? You know about Sherlock Holmes? Yes. And the one who wrote it, um, Sir Arthur um, Conan Doyle, he's actually a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. And there's a statement he makes um, Sherlock Holmes say, which I think is really, really um, important for persons to understand. And, you know, he says that, never theorize um, before you have data. Mm -hmm. Invariably, you will end up twisting facts to suit your theories instead of your theories to suit the facts. Mm -hmm. So essentially, what you have done and what many other persons have done, which is great, is you have sought out facts. Mm -hmm. You didn't make up a theory and mm -hmm. then say, well, let me now sugarcoat and find a few things and then see, I told you, see, you said, mm -hmm. no, let me get the information and then I'll come up with, my, with, with a theory. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's very, very important. So the first thing persons need to understand is from my own experience, I started um, residency in New York in July, 2017. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was one of the peak episodes of the influenza um, um, epidemic. So we had a really high case burden in 2017, 2018, right? At that time we came in, you know, we were fresh, young, the term they use is interns, your first year resident. And it was a lot of patients coming in, a lot of patients, right? We had to open up, you know, or the administration opened up areas in the hospital to facilitate um, the amount of patients that were coming in because of the flu. Now I'm gonna tell you what happened with coronavirus. Mm -hmm. There was not, maybe there was one, maybe two beds 
the entire hospital was almost coronavirus. Almost wow. every single bed. Wow. That's what I'm working is in Manhattan. Mm. And we were the heaviest to be hit. One of the heaviest hospitals to be hit was Elmhurst Hospital, mm. right? And our hospital, we went from having maybe about an 18 to 20 bed ICU and it just exploded to the point where we had ICU set up where ICU usually isn't. We brought ventilators in. There were more doctors that were brought in, more nurses, more respiratory therapists. So for someone who does not have that experience to now look at me and say, all of this thing is fake. I said, okay. <laughs> but I saw and I experienced and I had to take care of these patients. So either you want to disregard my own experience and what I saw mm -hmm. and listen to someone else who was who has not been involved in it who was not caring for these patients or you want to say hey this thing was real and I'm telling you I swear by Allah <laughs> this, this thing was more than real mm -hmm. okay the amount of patients that came to the hospital the mm -hmm. amount of ICU beds the amount of ventilators the amount of um increase in nursing staff, medical staff, respiratory therapy staff. This was mm -hmm. not, this is, this was not a hoax. This mm -hmm. was real. Mm -hmm. Now, when, um, you know, especially amongst the, the black community, as I mentioned before, there is actually a, just an absurd amount of misinformation. One of the, yeah. uh, these video clips that somebody had sent me was, from these, one of these, I'm sorry, man, these, these black charlatans, young Pharaoh. So young Pharaoh, I'm sorry, like, I don't know how else to say it. These, I don't understand why, these, these guys are like legit charlatans, man. They, they, they're like, anyway, he, he drives up to, I think it was same, same hospital you mentioned, Elmhurst Hospital, and he goes outside and he say, you see, nobody's here. Nobody is here. Look at these tents, they're empty. They're empty and nobody's here. What is, what is this pandemic? This pandemic is fake. They lie into you. They lie into you. This misinformation is being spread like rapidly throughout the black community. And I had one guy actually, he's Muslim, okay? He told me that uh, this is proof that the Saudi scholars have been misinformed about the coronavirus and therefore they're making fatawa based on, on erroneous information, something at that level. And I just asked him one question. You, you cannot be serious. You cannot be serious, right? So my question, wow. my question, and he blocked me for that. Legit, they're making wala wabara over these issues. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like wow. I said, for me, I'm just a simple guy. Like if something happens, I'm just going to ask the simple, small questions. I'm not going to go to the complicated questions, you know? So the simple, small questions I would ask, okay, they're saying the epicenter is new in New York. What are the mm -hmm. New York doctors saying? So what would you, what would you like to say to the black community, who are, especially the ones who are being affected by this false information? All right, so firstly, I think what is important for us to understand is there is a high level of mistrust amongst black people mm -hmm when it relates to the medical system. And for us to not analyze the history of where that mistrust came from is for us to do a disservice. Mm -hmm. When we look at the history of the medical system in the United States of America, what we find is that the social construct that was racism affected not just the economical system, but it affected the medical system. And so what I'd like to do is go through a few like, key dates and events that occurred so people have a firm understanding of why there is mistrust and why I cannot wrong anyone who has a mistrust of the medical system. I can't say, how can you mistrust us? How can you? No, they have every single right to mistrust based on the history. Mm -hmm. But what they have to keep in mind is the mistrust can also now further worsen 
what's happening to our community, and it is. Mm -hmm. And so we, it is important, every single one of us, it is important for us to analyze why there is mistrust and how we can fix it. So we look at, let's take it from, you know, 1865. You know, there is the um, 13th Amendment, there's abolishment of slavery, right? Now, in 18, about 1847, the American Medical Association, who is the essentially the mouthpiece for um, the practice of medicine in the United States of America, right, is is essentially legislated, and this, you know, they they they, they are established. So, in 1847, the American Medical Association um, uh, essentially was established, and their aim was to be the mouthpiece, to be the advocates for how medicine is practiced in the United States. At that time, African-American black doctors could not join, mm. could not be members, right? So now you have an establishment that's looking at how medicine is practiced that systematically excluded members of the population based on the social construct of how they look. Mm. And that's the reality. Mm -hmm. As a result, there was a response in 1895, a group of 12 black doctors formed the National Medical Association. And one of their key paradigm was that healthcare was not a, was not a privilege, but a right. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're hearing nowadays, not realizing mm -hmm. that came from the NMA. That did not come from the AMA. That's the reality, right? Mm -hmm. um, in 1910, so even before that, there was the establishment of historic, histor histor historically um, black colleges and universities, mm -hmm. right? Howard was established, um, Mehari in, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and a few other um, um, institutions. Because now you have freed slaves mm -hmm. after 1865 who need to get medical care, and you need to find somewhere, essentially, you know, to, or a means by which they're going to be cared for. These institutions and hospitals and clinics that were established were poorly funded. Mm -hmm. They didn't have enough um, assistance, right? And so now you have a situation where people are going to go for help or they're going to go somewhere for training and they're just not going to be able to have what's, you know, standard or quality care. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1910, the American Medical Association, then there was a guy by the name of Abraham... Flexner, I believe is his name. Abraham Flexner was authorized to go throughout the U.S. and Canada and find the institutions that do not have quality medical training. Mm. Guess what that meant? It's going to the black ones, right? They closed every single black institution mm -hmm. except for two. Wow. Howard University wow. and Meharu. Wow, that is very big. Very big. It led to the closing because now you have a policy paper saying all of these black institutions, they're not up to standard. They, they, yep. You know, you have these that doctors is... that they're just, they're, they're, essentially they're quacks. And when yes. that information gets out into the community, not only does the community not trust um, the establishment, they don't trust their own doctors. Wow. You guys are quacks, man. Wow, that's crazy, listen to man. So now this is deep seat antitrust at the structure of medicine and doctors who have their own complexion. I don't trust you, man. What are you talking about? Yeah. But Howard and Mehari, thankfully, were able to survive. Mm. And essentially, now, when you look throughout the history of medicine, mm. there, there are things that have been done to people of color, to black people, that is inexcusable. Yes. And the one that comes to mind is the. Inami. Yes. Inami. Yes. Inami. Yes. Inami. Yes. Inami. Yes, I love you. Inami. Yes. Inami. Yes. Inami. Yes. Inami. Yes. Inami. Yes, only you.